This program covers the torque converter and transmission used in the 510 and 515 payloaders. It discusses the mechanical and hydraulic principles involved in the construction and operation of the units and includes procedures for diagnosing and testing converter and transmission components. On the 510 and 515 payloaders, the engine is mounted in the rear frame facing the back of the machine. The integral torque converter transmission is bolted directly to the back of the engine flywheel housing. Power is delivered directly from the engine to the integral torque converter transmission. When the transmission is engaged, power flows through the transmission output shafts to the front and rear differentials. As shown in the illustration, the rear axle is positioned close to the transmission and the front axle is remotely mounted. The front axle is driven through two drive shafts coupled together behind the hanger bearing assembly. The hanger bearing provides support for the front drive shaft assembly. It allows power to be delivered to the front axle whether the loader is moving in a straight line or is articulated. The engine with the integral torque converter transmission is suspended on three points as one assembly. The transmission is supported by two rubber mounts, one on either side of the transmission housing. The front of the engine is mounted to a cross member that bolts on either side to the rear frame. The photo shows the engine being removed from the loader along with the converter transmission. If desired, the converter transmission can be removed from the vehicle by itself after being separated from the engine at the bell housing. The engine used in the 510 is the Noyce D260 H shown here. This four-cylinder diesel engine delivers 74 horsepower at 2500 RPM. The 515 uses the International D360 engine. This six-cylinder diesel engine delivers 95 horsepower at 2500 RPM. The converter transmission assembly used in the 510 and the 515 are identical in construction and operation. The only difference between the two is the stall ratio needed to match the converter with each of the two engines. The three main components of the torque converter are the impeller, the turbine, and the stator. When the engine is operating, the flywheel rotates the impeller through the drive ring. Oil is supplied to the converter at the center of the rotating impeller. As the impeller turns, it ejects the oil from its blades at a high velocity. The turbine blades are turned by the force of the ejected oil, as shown in the illustration. The turbine is spline mounted on the converter output transmission input shaft. The rotational force picked up by the turbine blades is transferred through this shaft directly into the transmission. The stator is a stationary component which redirects fluid from the turbine back to the impeller to increase torque output. The stator is mounted to the ground sleeve which is bolted to the inside of the converter housing. Oil for lube and converter operation is drawn from the sump at the bottom of the transmission and delivered by the charging pump to the converter through drilled passages in the ground sleeve. The charging pump for converter oil is driven by an accessory drive gear mounted at the rear of the impeller. A second pump is also driven by the accessory drive gear. It is the charging pump for the steering and loader system. The torque converter used on the 510 and 515 is a single phase, single stage unit. It has a diameter of 10.8 inches. The converter used in the 510 has a stall ratio of 2.95 to 1. The converter used in the 515 has a stall ratio of 2.85 to 1. The torque difference is produced by a change in the pitch of the impeller and stator blades. The driven gear that splines into the inside of the drive ring on the engine flywheel is visible in the photo at the front of the impeller housing. The accessory drive gear which operates the two charging pumps is visible at the rear of the impeller housing. 
The integral design of the torque converter transmission combines all hydraulic components in one easily serviced unit. The only hydraulic control system component not contained in the package is the oil cooler. The cooler is located in the lower tank of the radiator. The externally mounted components include the charging pump, pressure filter, and control valve. The integral design of the converter transmission requires only minimum mounting space. The number of hydraulic hoses and connecting components found in a conventional installation are greatly reduced. To further aid the serviceman, all converter transmission pressure test ports are conveniently located on the face of the control valve shown in the photo. The converter transmission charging pump is located at the top left side of the converter. This gear type pump has a rated capacity of 20 GPM at 2500 engine RPM. The pump draws oil from the transmission sump through a screen type strainer located on the inside of the mounting flange for the suction line. After leaving the pump, oil is sent by an external tube around the back of the transmission to the pressure filter located on the right side of the assembly. After passing through the pressure filter, oil is delivered to the control valve mounted on the left side of the converter housing. The suction strainer is located at the bottom of the transmission housing. It can be serviced by removing the mounting flange as shown in the photo. Oil going from the reservoir to the charging pump must flow through the suction strainer, which is shown attached to the inside of the mounting flange. The strainer has a 100 mesh screen and an internal 3 PSI differential bypass valve. The bypass valve eliminates the possibility of pump cavitation during a cold oil startup. Seven magnetic bars located around the outside of the screen are used to collect metallic particles that might be present in the system. The pressure filter assembly is bolted to the right side of the transmission and contains a replaceable paper element. The filter element is located in a filter can and has a five micron rating. A bypass valve is incorporated in the filter header. It will open if a differential of 30 PSI occurs between inlet and outlet line pressures. The main function of the bypass valve is to protect the filter element from over pressurization during a cold oil startup. Before going on further in the program, let's stop for a short review on the operation of the torque converter. Stop the tape while you are answering the questions. The answer to number one is B. The transmission and converter can be removed as a unit after being separated from the engine. A is not a correct answer. The engine can be removed as a unit with the converter and transmission, but this would be the procedure to follow only if the engine required overhaul at the same time. The answer to the second question, the three main components of the converter are the impeller, the stator, and the turbine. The answer to number three is B. The charging pump for converter oil is driven by an accessory drive gear off the impeller. The answer to number four is B. The torque converter used on the 515 has a lower stall ratio than the one used on the 510. The lower stall ratio produces the greater torque needed to handle the larger load capacity and weight of the 515. The torque increase takes place in the 515 without sacrificing speed because of the torque output of the D360 engine. And the answer to number five is A. Converter oil is filtered by both a suction and a pressure filter. The rotational torque picked up by the turbine wheel in the converter is delivered directly to the transmission through the converter output transmission input shaft. The transmission assemblies used on the 510 and 515 are completely identical. 
This full power shift, constant mesh, counter shaft design transmission provides three speeds forward and three speeds reverse. The major components of the transmission are the forward reverse clutch assembly, the first gear clutch assembly, the second and third gear clutch assembly, the reverse idler gear, and the output shaft. The transmission sump serves as a reservoir for the converter transmission hydraulic control system. The illustration shows the suction strainer filter located on the outlet line to the pump at the bottom of the reservoir. As can be seen in the illustration, the clutch pack shafts are supported at either end by ball bearings. The output shaft is supported at either end by tapered roller bearings. This photo shows a lifting device raising the torque converter housing off the rear of the transmission assembly. The converter housing can be easily separated from the transmission housing after the cap screws, which secure the two housings, are removed. Jack screw holes are also provided to aid in disassembly. In the unit shown in the photo, the charging pump, pressure filter, control valve, and all connecting lines have been removed. This photo shows the S710 transmission after the converter assembly has been removed. The converter output transmission input shaft is visible at the left. The clutch packs carried on this shaft are for forward and reverse. Because this shaft carries the forward and reverse clutch packs, it is sometimes called the directional shaft. The middle shaft carries the clutch pack for first speed. The lowest clutch pack shaft carries the clutch packs for second and third speed. The rear yoke of the transmission output shaft is visible at the right in the photo. The clutch assemblies are oil cooled and hydraulically actuated. This illustration shows the transmission directional shaft engaged for forward drive. Apply pressure oil from the control valve is being delivered through a drilled passage to the piston in the forward clutch pack. The line supplying the reverse pack is draining to sump. A third drilled passage in the center of the shaft is supplying oil to lubricate the free wheel bearings and to cool the clutch plates. In order to speed the release of the piston after disengagement, Oil is allowed to drain off by centrifugal force through an orifice in the outside of the carrier. A small amount of oil will drain through this orifice after apply pressure oil fills the area behind the piston. But this loss does not affect clutch pack performance. When the forward clutch pack engages, the drive gear at the left end of the clutch pack assembly stops freewheeling on its bearings and is hydraulically locked to the directional shaft. The forward drive gear can now deliver the rotation of the directional shaft to the first speed shaft driven gear. The forward and reverse clutch packs each contain eight friction plates and nine steel plates. The steel plates are externally splined and the friction plates are internally splined. The friction plates are bonded with a paper material. The plates used in the range packs are identical to those used in the directional packs. The first speed clutch pack contains five friction and six steel plates. The second and third speed packs each contain four friction and five steel plates. When the forward clutch pack is engaged, as described in the previous frame, power is transmitted to the forward driven gear shown in the illustration at the left end of the first speed shaft. If torque is transferred from the directional shaft through the reverse clutch pack, it would come to the first speed shaft through an idler gear to the reverse driven gear shown at the right end of the shaft. Since both driven gears are splined to the shaft, the shaft and both its gears are set into motion whenever torque is transferred from the directional shaft by either forward or reverse clutch pack engagement. When the first range clutch pack is engaged, the first speed drive gear, 
shown in dark gray in the illustration, stops freewheeling on its two bearings and accepts the motion of the shaft. Power goes from the first speed drive gear to the next lower shaft in the transmission. This illustration shows power flow through the entire transmission when the transmission is engaged for first speed forward. In the S710 transmission, all gears are in constant mesh. If the directional lever is in the neutral position, the converter output transmission input shaft would turn, but both the forward and the reverse clutch packs would free wheel. No drive would be delivered to the rest of the transmission. When the forward pack is engaged, it delivers power from the directional shaft to the forward driven gear on the first speed shaft. Since the driven gear is splined to the shaft, the shaft also picks up this rotation. When the first speed pack is engaged, shaft rotation is picked up by the first speed drive gear located in the middle of the sleeve on the first speed shaft. Since this gear is meshed with the gear spline to the middle of the second and third speed shaft, this shaft is put into motion and delivers power to the output shaft as shown in the illustration. Because of the constant mesh design of the transmission, the clutch packs for reverse, second speed, and third speed will freewheel on their shafts when the transmission is engaged for first speed forward. When the transmission is shifted to second speed forward, the forward speed clutch pack will be engaged as it was for first speed. Once again, it will deliver power from the directional shaft to the forward driven gear at the left end of the first speed shaft. And since the driven gear is splined to the shaft, the shaft and the gear splined at the right end of the shaft will also pick up this forward rotation. The second speed clutch pack engages and causes the torque to transfer to the second and third speed shaft. As shown in the illustration, the second and third speed shaft rotation is transferred to the output shaft through the gear at the right end of the shaft. The first speed clutch pack shaft is set in motion for all gear selections. In first speed, Torque is delivered to the second and third speed shaft through the gear on the sleeve in the center of the first speed shaft. In second speed, torque which was delivered to the first speed shaft is transferred through the gear at the right end of the shaft. In third speed, torque is transferred through the gear at the left end of the shaft. This photo shows the second and third speed clutch shaft assembly removed from the transmission. Four gears are visible in the photo. The first speed driven gear and the gear to the output shaft are both splined to the second and third speed shaft. The third speed input and second speed input gears are bearing mounted to the shaft. Both of these gears free wheel unless either clutch pack is engaged. When first speed is selected, power is delivered to the shaft through the first speed driven gear. Power is then transmitted from the shaft through the gear to the output shaft. When first speed is selected, the second and third speed clutch pack input gears free wheel on the shaft. If second speed is selected, the clutch pack on the right side of the shaft is engaged and power enters the shaft through the second speed input gear. If third speed is selected, the clutch pack on the left end of the shaft engages to accept power. Motion is always transmitted from the shaft through the gear to the output shaft. When the transmission is shifted into reverse, torque is delivered from the directional shaft through the engaged reverse clutch pack drive gear at the right end of the shaft. In reverse, torque is transferred to the first speed shaft through the idler gear, which rotates on a stub shaft positioned in the transmission housing. The direction of rotation of the first speed shaft is opposite from what it was for forward drive. The first speed clutch pack engages and transfers torque 
from the first speed shaft to the second and third speed shaft through the drive gear on the sleeve in the middle of the shaft. The only difference between first speed forward and first speed reverse is the opposite direction of motion picked up by the first speed shaft as torque is transferred through the idler gear. If second speed reverse is selected, the first speed pack free wheels and the reversed rotation of the first speed shaft is delivered through the gear splined at the right end of the shaft to the engaged second speed gear. In third speed reverse, torque would be transferred from the first speed shaft in reverse direction through the gear splined at the left end of the first speed shaft. The rotation of the second and third speed shaft is transferred to the output shaft in the normal manner through the gear at the right end of the shaft. Let's take a brief pause now for some review questions on the construction and operation of the S710 transmission. Stop the tape while you are answering the questions. The answer to number one is C. The transmission used in the 510-515 has three speeds forward and three speeds reverse. The answer to number two is B. The transmission is integral with the converter, connected by the converter output transmission input shaft. The answer to number three is A. The middle clutch pack shaft carries the clutch pack for first speed. The answer to number four is C. The first speed shaft is set in motion for all forward and reverse selections. The clutch pack gear on the first speed shaft is engaged only when first speed is selected, but the shaft and the gears splined at the ends of the shaft are in motion whenever the engine is running. The answer to number five is also C. The transmission output shaft sends drive to both the front and the rear axles. The output shaft is seen at the bottom of the illustration. An output yoke is attached at either end of the shaft. The transmission control valve assembly is conveniently mounted on the left side of the S710 transmission. Oil is drawn from the transmission sump and is delivered through a pressure filter to the control valve inlet port indicated on the photo. The control valve regulates main system pressure, converter pressure, and lube oil flow. The eye ends of the directional and range spools are visible at the left side of the valve housing. These spools are connected through mechanical linkage to the transmission control levers in the operator's compartment. When a control spool is shifted, oil is directed through internal passages in the control valve to the selected clutch pack. The control valve also governs the rate of pressure buildup on oil sent to the clutch packs in order to produce a soft shift. A transmission disconnect circuit is also built into the control valve. It is controlled by the solenoid valve visible at the right side of the housing. Transmission system pressure is governed by the operation of the main pressure regulator valve spool. Oil from the charging pump enters a port at the right end of the valve assembly. Oil then flows around an annulus and through the fill orifice shown below the valve assembly. Back pressure builds on the charging oil as it flows through the fill orifice. This causes oil to flow through flats along the outside of the main regulator spool. Oil moves behind the right end of the spool and overcomes the tension of the 30 PSI spring, shifting the spool to the left, as shown in the illustration. With the regulator spool in this position, oil coming in at the port on the top of the spool not only flows around the annulus to the fill orifice, but is also indexed to a passage which supplies oil to the converter. A cold oil condition at startup will cause the spool to move fully to the left, opening an additional passage to sump. 
Incoming oil passes through the fill orifice, then flows through the directional and range spools to the selected clutch packs. Incoming oil also enters a port at the left end of the control valve and flows through a timing orifice in the dump spool. As flow continues, the modulator piston will move to the right, as indicated by the arrow, against the tension of the five internal springs. Movement of the modulator piston stops when the sealing edge of the piston reaches the drain ports. By the time pressure relieves to sump through the drain ports at the modulator piston, compression forces on a total of six springs has brought main pressure to a minimum of 310 PSI. When main pressure is at 310 PSI, pressure on the oil in the cavity between the dump spool and the modulator piston will be 280 PSI. Modulation pressure will always be 30 PSI lower than main pressure because it is affected only by the five internal springs. It is not affected by the additional external 30 PSI spring located around the outside of the main regulator spool. The soft shift modulation system acts like a shock absorber for clutch pack engagement. A pressure of at least 300 PSI is required for solid clutch pack engagement. The system is designed so that a certain measured amount of time is required to develop this pressure whenever the transmission is shifted to a new gear. Whenever a shift is made, oil rushes to fill the engaging packs, causing a momentary pressure drop between the fill orifice and the restrictor orifice. This pressure drop has no noticeable effect on the position of the main regulator spool at the right end of the valve assembly, since the fill orifice restricts the rate of flow out of that end. Incoming oil continues to compress the spring on the outside of the regulator spool, and oil continues to flow to the torque converter during modulation. The pressure drop resulting from filling the clutch packs does, however, greatly affect the position of the components on the left end of the valve assembly. For an instant, all oil flowing past the fill orifice goes directly to the clutch packs instead of flowing to the components at the left end of the valve assembly. Simultaneously, oil in the modulation cavity between the dump spool and the modulator piston begins to be pushed out under pressure resulting from the expansion of the five internal springs located behind the modulator piston. The modulator piston and the dump spool both move to the left as oil opens the one-way check valve and flows into the void caused by oil going to the clutch packs. As the dump spool is moved to the left, a cord passage from the back side of the accumulator piston is indexed to a drain passage allowing the accumulator piston also to begin moving to the left. As oil behind the accumulator piston begins to drain to sump, the dump spool moves far enough to the left to index the oil in the modulation cavity to a drain passage. Pressure on the oil behind the dump spool momentarily drops off to approximately 15 PSI. It is affected only by the tension of the light spring behind the accumulator piston. Under this low pressure condition, oil from the charging pump closes the check valve and begins once again to flow across the restrictor orifice to the left side of the valve assembly. Incoming oil continues to move the accumulator piston to the left and at the same time stabilizes the position of the dump spool. Oil being pushed out of the modulation cavity by the expansion force of the five internal springs is metered as it flows to drain across the face of the dump spool. Because of the 15 PSI spring behind the accumulator piston and a 5 PSI spring on the left side of the dump spool, oil in the modulation cavity never drops below 20 PSI. The rate of flow of oil past the restrictor orifice is closely matched with the rate of flow of oil draining to sump across the face of the dump piston. Before the springs behind the modulator piston are able to completely relax, the accumulator piston will bottom out because of the flow of incoming oil. 
This illustration shows the position of the components of the modulation system shortly after the fill cycle begins. The accumulator piston has already bottomed out and is shown moving to the right toward its rest position. When the accumulator piston bottomed, the flow of incoming oil was immediately restricted, causing an increase of pressure on the left side of the dump spool. This increased pressure caused the dump spool to move far enough to the right to index the flow of incoming oil to the cord passage leading to the back side of the accumulator piston. The pressure of the oil on both sides of the accumulator piston was immediately equalized, but the differential caused by the accumulator spring forces the piston to move to the right until it reaches its rest position against the roll pin stop. At the beginning of each shift, Pressure in the modulation cavity will drop to 20 PSI. It will remain at 20 PSI throughout the draining cycle because of the metering action of the dump spool. But after the accumulator piston bottoms and the dump spool has moved fully to the right, the drain ports are cut off, causing the pressure increase to be felt on both sides of the dump piston. At the beginning of a shift, main pressure drops to 50 PSI. The 50 PSI pressure results from the compression of the external 30 PSI spring on the outside diameter of the regulator spool, and the additional 20 PSI compression remaining on the internal springs resulting from the metering action of the dump spool. When the clutch packs completely fill, main pressure starts to rise from the initial 50 PSI. This increase in pressure is also felt at the clutch packs and on the oil at the left end of the valve assembly. By the time the dump spool reseats completely, fully to the right as shown in the illustration, main pressure has reached 65 to 75 PSI. Oil now begins to flow through the timing orifice of the dump spool against the face of the modulator piston. With the clutch plates firmly set, Pressure builds rapidly in the directional and range clutch packs as the modulator piston is moved to the right against spring tension. Pressure continues to increase until the modulator piston has moved far enough to the right to index the oil in the cavity to a drain passage. Oil flow is metered at the sealing edge of the modulator piston to maintain a main pressure reading of 310 to 335 PSI. Maximum modulation time is needed going into first gear, especially when going from first speed forward to first speed reverse or vice versa. Less modulation time is needed for a shift to second or third speeds. In these speeds, modulation time is cut back by adding makeup oil to the modulation cavity from an annular groove around the range spool. The makeup oil comes from the range spool through an orifice passage after the plates are set. The orifice in the second speed supply passage, as shown in the illustration, reduces by one third the time required for the modulation sequence. The orifice for third speed is larger than the one used in second. It reduces the cycle time even further. This illustration shows the components of the modulation circuit at the end of a fill sequence. Let's stop briefly to answer a few questions in review on the modulation circuit. Stop the tape while you are answering the questions. The answer to number one is B. The modulator piston pushes the oil out of the central cavity of the valve when a shift is made. The modulator piston is moved to the left as compression is relieved on the five springs between the modulator piston and the main regulator valve. The answer for number two is A. The check valve, which is connected in parallel with the restrictor orifice, opens for a brief instant after each shift is made. The check valve opens when the pressure drop occurs initially as fill oil rushes to the clutch pack. The check valve closes as soon as pressure behind the dump piston drops lower than fill pressure 
as modulation system oil drains to the reservoir? The answer to number three is C. Modulation pressure will always be 30 PSI lower than main pressure because of the spring on the outside of the main regulator spool. The answer to number four is C. Main pressure will drop off to 50 PSI at the beginning of a shift. This program continues on tape two.